Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Oh, oh The Places We'll Go show. Uh, if you're in the UK anyway, it's been a pretty stormy week, a bumpy week. Um, but this is the show that will give you a lift into the weekend. And here we talk to some amazing people and their ups and downs in life, but the, the path to which they became the great successes they've become. And I'm absolutely thrilled to have Karen Blackett on the show this morning. Welcome, Karen. So uh, just to do a bit of an intro around Karen. Karen is perhaps the icon of the UK advertising landscape. Uh, she certainly achieved so much in her 27 years within media. So apparently she did geography at university back in the day, but I think on the quiet actually, Karen is a physicist, or at least that's the only explanation I've got of the way she manages to bend time to fit everything in that she does. Uh, earlier in her career, Karen was twice voted by Management Today as one of the 35 most powerful women under 35 in the UK. I think that's unique. I think I'm saying that, twice, no, twice voted. In 2011, Karen became CEO of Mediacom UK uh, and became chair in 2016 and then picked up her OBE along the way for services to media and communications. Indeed, Karen, you are our first honoured guest on the show, so that's awesome. Uh, currently, Karen is uh, both country manager of WPP in the UK and CEO of Group M in the UK. So both of these roles separately are massive in combination, from my point of view, unimaginable. And we'll hear a bit, a little bit about that. Um, this while also being appointed as race equality uh, business champion by the Prime Minister, no less, in 2018, having been a business advisor to the Department of International Trade prior to that. So, I mean, it's, it is sort of unfathomable how Karen fits it all in. Uh, but from my point of view, what's even more remarkable is that Karen remains grounded and very generous, both in spirit and time for others. So, Karen, it's absolutely fantastic to have you on the show. We are indeed humbled. Thank you. It's great to be here. So thank you. Well, thank you. And I'll just hand over to Richie and he can tee up our competition and then we can get started. Great. Well, Karen, first of all, welcome from me as well. Like it's an abs a genuine absolute pleasure to have you on. Um, so guys, um, every week we try and give you something a little bit extra, a little bit magical um, and to keep you all engaged um, with us. Now, I think this week we have a particularly special prize for you. Karen has been very generous and is going to donate a, a mentoring session to one lucky winner on the show today. Um, so I, I, to be honest with you, I wish I could win it. Um, but, uh, but since I can't take part, um, it's over to, to someone um, in the audience. Now, the usual format applies. What we would like you to do is take a screenshot of the show um, and actually put down your favorite question that you would pitch to Karen. Um, in the post and then copy myself, Mark and Jordan into the post. And as you know, Jordan will then announce the winner later on today. So I do genuinely say that all of you, please do take part. This is a fabulous opportunity. Um, so look, without further ado, I want to start asking Karen the first question. Karen, how do you fit it all in? Uh, I did do uh, physics as an A-level, so uh, <laughs> Mark has done his research really well. But you know what? I think when you enjoy what you do or you're passionate about what you do, you find the time. And you always hear that old adage about uh, ask a busy person to do something. Uh, and, and that's the same with me. I, I think it's a huge privilege to be able to work in the industry that I work in it's a huge privilege to be able to have the network of people that I talk to and work with inside the industry and outside of the industry and there's certain things which I really believe in my dad always said to me learn earn and serve so learn your craft earn your money serve by giving back make sure you give back so you find the time I love that own, learn, and serve. Very, very cool. Um, Karen, let me ask, um, current times, I know you've just come back from a little short break, um, but how has the last couple of months been for you um, on both, you know, practically and, and emotionally? It's been tough, and I think anyone that hasn't found it tough, I don't know where they've been, but it has been tough because we were all thrown into this experiment that none of us willingly signed up to, which was suddenly all working remotely, suddenly having to get to grips with all of the different tech platforms that we'd been putting off um, and suddenly having to learn. I mean, I literally think I could go into IT now, having to learn about all of the different platforms 
to make sure that we could still work, still communicate uh, with each other and with our clients. And on top of that, I sort of started the additional role. I, so I started the Group M role during lockdown, which is a challenge because, you know, you'd normally in any new role spend time walking the floors, chatting to people at their desks, picking up the mood at the at the kitchen at the tea point you'd find out things or hear things so none of that was possible and I had to get to know a new team remotely so on top of you know the global pandemic working remotely I was then also suddenly a school teacher so I'm a single mum of a 10 year old boy and I was thrown into remote learning for school um, and then just as you think you're conquering all of that everything that happened in the US and the killing of George Floyd uh, crystallized in the groundswell of movement for Black Lives Matters again. And, you know, I am black, I have a black son and it was emotional. So I was suddenly thrown into mass grieving as well and dealing with our teams in the UK where it hit them as well. So it was a lot, it was an awful lot to manage. Um, but thankfully, I'm surrounded by brilliant people, even though they're virtual and on a screen, uh, amazing, talented people. And I know how to ask for help. And I think that's really important, knowing when to ask for help. Yeah, Karen, you, you mentioned George Floyd, and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely come back to that. But um, more generally, um, what, what do you think the world will take away from this COVID moment? Do you know what? I... It's not, and I know we're going to talk about um, Black Lives Matters later, but it is not the first time, unfortunately, that we have seen a black man killed on camera. It's not. The difference this time round is I think as a society, we are different. So if I think about the Rodney King killing in LA in the 90s, I think how we are now as a society is different to then. And that gives me a lot of hope and I think it has been a catalyst for businesses and individuals to do more. I think we were already doing things but I think it was the absolute catalyst that we needed to make sure that those plans which were on our priority list but not near the top are now near the top of our priority list. So I am hoping what we learned from COVID, um, we bring back all the best bits that we have adapted and learned during lockdown. So all the best bits in terms of, look, you know, if you're in a global role, you do not have to travel one week out of every month. You don't because this is incredibly effective. We can still communicate. We can still lead. We can still make a difference without physically being in the market. Of course, it's important that you're there and you have face time. But I hope that's changed things and allows more people and different types of people to go into global roles. And I also hope that it means that we check in with each other more because I've seen a lot of that. So the one thing that I've learned during the lockdown and this crisis is simplicity of communication, frequency of communication, and absolutely having clear leadership being present. And I think that clarity, simplicity, and presence, I hope we bring back into our work, our, our working world, which has changed forever. I love that. That talks to the, you know, despite it, all the learning opportunities leaders. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's a great thought. But who, who's going to be winners and losers? Who's going to come out of this stronger? Who's going to come out of it weaker? Well, do you know what? I think um, those brands which absolutely know their target audience and have a very clear understanding of their audience and a very clear defined purpose, I think will come out the winners because I talk a lot about, you know, in our industry, how building trust is incredibly important whether that's you know whatever side of the fence that you are on in our industry or part of the ecosystem and there's that brilliant book the trusted advisor that talks about trust equals credibility plus reliability plus empathy divided by self-orientation 
And those brands that showed real empathy for their target audience, because they knew their target audience, they understood what their target audience was going through. They were able to adapt and be agile and fleet of foot are going to come out further ahead of their competitors in a current industry where you know who knows what's coming next who knows if that second wave is coming who knows if there's going to be lockdowns again who knows so those brands that really showed that understanding of their target audience adapted to the mood of the nation use this time to really look at the business and be agile and fleet of foot will come out stronger i'm just smiling because i can hear my dogs grumbling in the background because there's a literally a gardener outside my patio doors <laughs> trying to weed some pots and they're, they're, they're giving him a warning grumble at the moment Good, good, good. Um, fi final question on COVID. Uh, so um, we live in an, equal, an unequal world. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the impact of COVID in terms of quality? Do you know what it is? COVID, <laughs> COVID was a discriminator. It really was because it affected people from more diverse backgrounds and people from more socially economic challenge background more and i worry about how businesses have adapted and trimmed and looked at their cost base and whether that means that you know all of our industries trying to look at more diversity and inclusion whether some of the decisions that have been made have affected that goal and mission for diversity because I worry about who we have had to make redundant and let go and whether we've really scrutinized who those people are. I worry that, you know, as businesses, we are really managing the bottom line and coming out of COVID, we are still making sure that we are tightening and buttoning down the hatches and tightening our belts. And I worry about how much that means that we can spring forward in terms of more inclusion and diversity in our industry. And I worry that actually COVID has probably been the worst thing for gender equality, because as far as we have gone in terms of gender equality in our industry and in society, COVID hit and we have found, unfortunately, that the lion's share of homeschooling, housework has fallen to the women in the family. And we've sort of gone back 50 years in terms of how we are striving for gender equality. So. That doesn't really give you an answer. I'm sort of, I'm, 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 I'm concerned. I am worried. And I think we'll find out the true effect. You know, furlough stops in October and we're going to have more unemployment hits. I, I worry when we review our businesses and we look at our businesses and we start looking at how we sprint out of 2020. And I am really sprinting out of 2020 into 2021 the shape of our business is going to be very different and the makeup of our business is going to be very different. Well, that's a good warning that there's still an enormous amount to be done and a, a nudge to all of us, more than a nudge. Uh, so thank you, Karen. Karen, I just want to pick up on a, a perhaps touch on another sort of segment um, around this um, and, and clearly being A-Levels week this week, mm. um, there's been a lot of talk about the lost generation that because of the, you know, the likes of homeschooling, because of the exam disruptions and results disruptions that are taking place, um, how do you see this impacting upon young people? And perhaps what advice could you give them at this point in time to, as use your term, springboard their careers? Look, I think you don't worry is the first thing. I, I have to say, and I know that's really easy to say, but I don't know anyone on this call that would have aced everything at school. And somehow we've all managed to have brilliant careers and good careers. So, and I know it seems like the end of the world as you are going through it. I know it does. If you have been downgraded in your predicted scores, you didn't have the opportunity to demonstrate how much you've learned over the last two years and you see the industry or businesses or organizations that you want to go into contracting um, and it's tougher get, to get into. I totally and utterly get it but what you've 
got to do um, is really, you've got to be resilient. You have got to be resilient. And I say to my son, and it's something that my son's um, Manny says to him, uh, for every, you know, minor setback, major comeback. And you, we've, all, we've got to remember that. It's literally, there will be these setbacks, but there will be a major comeback that we work on. So if, if you're passionate about getting into an industry, you're passionate about going to university, keep trying. Literally, don't try the trodden path or traditional path. You've, this is when you've got a zigzag. This is when you've got a hustle. We all have side hustles. This is when you really have to demonstrate your resilience and hustle because I genuinely believe that things happen for a reason and it's not always the path that you thought was going to happen, maybe the path that you end up on. So just keep, just keep the faith, keep being resilient, don't let it knock you back and hustle. Now is the time to really hustle. And if you're not somebody that's comfortable doing that, employ an army of people, whether that's your parents, friends, family, to hustle on your behalf. Because not everybody is, you know, wants to or able to. Make sure that you ask for help and get people to do it for you. And as an industry, we've got, a th we've got to be broader how we think about talent coming into our industry. And that's something that I've always talked about. We can't keep looking at the traditional routes in we've got to try harder and we've got to have more outreach as well rather than just waiting for people to come in or selecting from the small pool of universities that seems to be the feeder for our industry. Karen, oh God, I mean, it's totally resonant with, with what, what, what you just said there. Just, I, you know, it's a two-way street on both these fronts. And actually what I find is the likes of digital and social today gives everybody unprecedented access to hustle harder. Absolutely. And reach into those places that you never thought you could. And so that just, it just totally, you know, you've, you've, you've hit a really raw nerve with me there. So that's, that's brilliant. So Karen, you, you talked about um, managing careers. Um, we've, we've said already a couple of times, you've had a, an amazing and interesting and um, career. Can, can you just join the dots how you got from where you were to where you are? How I started from a geography graduate into uh, WPP, country manager and group MCEO. So look, I, as part of my geography degree, I did stats. So this was my hustle. So I did not do a vocational degree um, because I am quite old. And at the time, vocational degrees in media didn't exist. So I did not do a vocational degree to get my way into the industry. So I studied what I loved and I loved geography because geography was full of people that didn't know what they really wanted to do when they finished. So it was a little bit of everything. Um, and I absolutely loved it because I found it really broad and brilliant and uh, great knowledge base. I did everything from the geography of crime, which I did use when we pitched for the Met Police many moons ago, back in the early 90s, um, and how the physical environment can affect um, criminal behaviour. Um, so I, I love geography and I came out and I started to apply for different roles in ad agencies. I wasn't quite sure what a media agency was, but I was applying in media agencies, marketing functions of, you know, well-known organizations and brands. And I got rejection after rejection after rejection because I was trying to get into the industry on the back of the last recession. And again, the industry had contracted. And uh, that's when I started to use the stats side of my degree and apply and be a little bit more lateral thinking in terms of how I got a foot in the door. So I applied to um, uh, an auditor uh, who at the time was uh, associated with a agency, a media agency. So it was an ad I applied using the stats side of my degree. I went in and had an interview. They invited me back for a second interview and I had to present on the pros and cons of Sky TV. Uh, uh, and it was during that interview, they saw something in me and just said, you know what, you should speak to the planning teams at the agency and they sort of pivoted me and I went and spoke to uh, the direct response planning team at the agency um, and that's how I got a foot in the door so I started off as a direct response planner and buyer 
Um, and I, and I think Mark, you sort of mentioned it, I zigzagged in my career because I wanted to find out all about the industry and what I was good at um, and what the opportunities were. So some of the moves I made were lateral moves. They didn't necessarily get me a promotion. They didn't necessarily get me more money, but they got me more experience. So, and I did that purposely, A, because um, I, once I plateau and I stop learning, I need to move on. Um, so I zigged and zagged quite a bit through the industry from, you know, direct response to planner buyer to strategic planner to a media manager through to, you know, uh, a business director through to marketing a new business through to uh, leaving the UK and working in EMEA um, in terms of, you know, chief operating officer for EMEA. Um, through to then becoming CEO and getting into a leadership position of a media agency. So I purposely zigzagged um, and that just meant I had more strings to my bow. And I also think it really helped me as a leader because you've done the roles, you've done so many different roles. You can understand where tension exists between different teams or different departments. And also, you know, when somebody's trying to pull the wool over your eyes <laughs> because you've done the role. Um, and so I purposely zigzagged and I, and I do think that has made me a better leader because I know what it's like to be thrown into a learning dip when you go into something new and there's that natural dip because you don't know what you're doing and you feel as though you're not in control and you feel as though that you're not conquering anything. And I think being plunged into a learning dip is good for all of us because it takes you back to basics. It really gets you to dig deep and it makes you listen and it really makes you listen to the people already in that area already doing things and I think moving around and changing roles plunges you into that learning dip and you come out of it you always come out of it and I think you come out of it better. Karen I want to pick up on that word dip that you just mentioned but perhaps in a slightly different context and um, what has been the lowest dip for you in your career? You know, uh, there, there are always times that you remember um, because you remember how it made you feel. So there's always times that you really remember. And there's, you know, there's always those occasions on pitches that when you've lost a client that you've worked with for a while and you feel as though you've put your best foot forward and the client has decided to leave and go elsewhere that hurts it does hurt so and I have loads of those instances where we've been pitching and it's more when it's existing clients rather than trying to win new clients because you feel as though you're breaking up in a marriage and you feel as though that you're being left so that those hurts because you've built a relationship and then they decide to go elsewhere so those always those are always a dip and, and my lowest ebb when you lose a client a long-term client that you've worked with and you've built and you've grown together but also there's those moments in your career that you remember because it's how somebody else has made you feel and it's things that aren't within your ability to change and control so i talk a lot about how i have experienced racism in the industry and never to my face, so never to my face, always behind my back. And I think that's worse because if it's to my face, I know what I'm dealing with. I absolutely know what I'm dealing with and I know how to handle it. And I do remember, and it's, it was a f several years ago now, and I do remember, um, and I sort of talk about it in a, a, a couple of books that people have written about, you know, what's the, what's the lowest point. And I remember pitching for a well-known breakfast cereal. And uh, it was when I was a business director and we did not win the pitch. And uh, the, and it's a small industry, so you sort of know your competitors. And I knew the person that was going to be the business director at the agency that won. And, uh, you know, they did exactly what I would do. You know, they thanked the client, took the client out for dinner to thank them for awarding them the business and to start getting to know them and use that opportunity to start getting a bit of competitive insight to find out what all the other agencies did in their pitches. So you get that you know, insight into what other agencies are doing, which helps you. 
And so they asked about the other agencies and they asked about the agency that I was at and asked, you know, what were they like? And it was two male clients. And uh, the two male clients said, you know, well, this agency, they, you know, they were good. Actually, they were really good, actually. And we kept them in the running because they were really good. So, you know, when it goes down to a final two and we were the bridesmaid and not the bride, you know, they were really good. But uh, there's no way we would have had a female account director, let alone a black one was the feedback and and I knew the individual at the other agency and they told me what these two clients had said and that hurt because it's personal there's nothing I can do about my gender and there's nothing I want to do about my gender there's nothing I can do about my ethnicity and there's nothing that I want to do about my ethnicity it wasn't about the work it was about me so I went into a period of feeling as though I'd lost the agency, the business, because I'm a black woman. And that made me feel incredibly guilty. And it was really hurtful. Then you move from feeling guilty to being really angry because it's you're really angry. And then you move to, right, revenge. <laughs> so I quickly moved to revenge, which was, right, I am going to demonstrate and show those individuals that they've lost out on a brilliant agency and actually, I'm quite talented. So you go and pitch for their nearest competitor. <laughs> you make sure that you win it. And I do believe in karma as well. I genuinely believe in karma. And those two individuals left that company within 13 months and not of their own accord. So I, I genuinely believe in karma. And again, there's this mantra that and I've had a life coach for since God was a boy for about 20 years. And uh, I remember my life coach telling me about this sort of Buddhist phrase that holding on to anger is like holding on to a hot coal. You're the only person that gets burnt. And it's true. You've got to let that anger go. You've got to let it go because it's just going to affect you. Those two individuals weren't thinking about me and the decision. They'd moved on, whereas I was holding on to it. You just got to let it go and then get into revenge stage, which I think helps. <laughs> a dish fresh served cold uh, well it's, it's a that's a great story for her, people to hear tough but important to hear yeah but but Karen I, I mean the whole sense of you is learning adaptability pivoting like pace energy speed um I, I think I've heard you before talk about the benefit of being at top level athletics before yeah. your career and some of the traits that you learned then that have stood you in good stead I'd love, love for you to talk a little bit about that so uh, I've got my son sitting on the sofa and he's going to, he's rolling his eyes. It's like, oh God, here we go again. So, so I was uh, a sprinter. So I sprinted at quite high level. So I was a sprinter and a long jumper and a bend runner for the four by 100. So I was a specialist bend runner. Um, and I always preferred the third leg to the first leg. I hated being the start leg on the relay because you, you've got a staggered start and you can't really see what's happening, especially in your, when you're in one of the outer lanes because you can't see what's going on behind you. So I always liked the third leg because the race was on. But, you know, as a sprinter and a long jumper, I could win the 100 metres in the first 30 if I got a start. I was much better at indoor athletics than outdoor because it's 60 metres rather than 100 metres. But I could win if I got a good start and I'd win it over the first 30 and then it was just about me hanging on. So I used to practice over and over again with my coach on my starting blocks over and over again. And that's what I take into my working life. I practice. If I know I have a big presentation coming up, I will practice and I will rehearse and I rehearse and I rehearse just to make sure that I know how to nail a presentation or I will practice questions that might come up so that I know how to answer. I am incredibly focused. And again, that comes from my athletics training as well, just being really focused and really disciplined. Um, and I see feedback as a gift. So when I used to do my athletics and my long jump, you know, my coach and my dad would stand at the end of the long jump pitch with a camera taking videos, taking photos that I could see my takeoff, I could see my form and they'd use that footage or they'd use the photos 
to show me what I was doing and I would and I seek feedback now because I genuinely see it as a way of me getting better people feedback so that I can get better so I don't see it as a criticism and I genuinely believe that it's a gift so again in my working life I ask for feedback I look for see feedback I seek feedback Gary, you, you know you mentioned um and it's, you know, it, it shines through around the discipline that you have in order to kind of juggle these many, many sort of balls and hoops that you've got going on. Um, how, does, how do you kind of juggle the, the work-life balance side of it then? I mean, do you kind of fit some of this stuff into your home life as well and have that discipline too? Yeah, uh, look, I, I talk about work-life blend. So I met a brilliant uh, woman called Anna Rasmussen that runs an organization called the Open Blend Method. And she talks about how work is life and life is work. And it's about how you blend the two. And uh, I, I try to do that as best as I can. Um, of course, I want to be present at work, good at my job. I want to make sure that I lead and reassure the teams that I work with. And I believe that leadership is from the front, the middle and behind. But I also want to make sure that I'm a good mum as well. And that's incredibly important to me because it's just me and him at home. Um, and so I don't want Isa asking for ID when I walk through the door because I'm never present and I'm always in the office. Um, so it just means that I'm really disciplined with my diary. So I am really disciplined with my diary. I will not do more than two evening events a week. And even that I think is a lot. You know, my son's going to be going through 11 plus if they go back to school um, in January next year. And it's really important for me that I coach, mentor, help, sponsor, cheerlead him um, so that means I'm going to be incredibly disciplined with my diary. I will be doing more events like this where it's international events so that I don't have to travel. I'll still be there. I still want to be involved, but I'm going to be doing it on Zoom or Teams or whatever the platform of choice is so that I can be present and, and be there. But I need to be I need to be home. And this is a crucial moment for him. And I need to be home. So I'm very conscious about work-life blend but I think it's really important that Isaac sees how much I work as well and the things that I do outside my work so I talk to him about my work he's involved in my work you know last night he was asking me about this and what I'm doing this morning and looking at the sorts of questions and he was pretending that he could answer some of the questions and he'd be me so it's really important for him to see that I enjoy work and that work is something that to be enjoyed not something that you have to do Mark, 10 minutes to go. Let's do some quick fire. Let's, let's do the quick fire. So I'll, I'll, I'll start off. So Karen, I also know you've got a bit of a cricketing origin. So this is where we'll, we'll this <laughs> our easy in to quick fire. So uh, we've got about 10 quick fire questions. One word answers. Um, it will all be fine. Okay. Bat or bowl? <laughs> all rounder. No, you've got to choose. Okay. Batter. Okay. Viv Richards or Gary Sobers? Oh, cigar field. Okay. Uh, what age do you want to retire? I don't. Favourite okay. junk food? Favourite what? Junk food. Any form of pasta. Favourite childhood TV show? Oh, um, Danger Mouse or He-Man. <laughs> oh, He-Man, legend. Something loftier. What does a person need to be happy? Family. What's the best age? Uh, over 40. I've got a funny feeling the next answer is going to be you don't, but <laughs> how many hours of sleep do you need? Uh, I, Isaac, let mum do that. Sorry, I can just see my son with a bread knife. Um, uh, five. Giving presents or getting presents? Giving. If Kim Kardashian and Donald Trump were both... <laughs> I don't know where this is going, but go on. <laughs> Kim Kardashian and Donald Trump were both drowning and you could save one, who would it be? <laughs> Kim. Very good. Very no good. explanation necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Climb a mountain or jump from a flame? 
Uh, adrenaline rush jumping from a plane. Okay. And uh, very last one. If you were really hungry, would you eat a bug? Yeah. Protein. Easy end. Easy end. Okay, we go, we're going to, we wanted to talk a bit about um, DNI and and ethnicity, but just before we do, I just noticed Nigel Ashton's got a question, which is a good one, actually. Uh, brilliant advice here from Karen. I'd love to know what your best piece of advice is for building a personal brand in this industry and beyond. Do you know what? Um, so Peter Drucker did his um, book and uh, about personal branding, and he sort of talked about a personal statement. And there's four core questions that he asked that you need to be able to answer in order to have a personal brand and to build your personal brand. And I go back and I review my answers to the four questions every year. So whereas most people have a New Year's resolution, which is about fitness, mine is about reviewing the answers to the four questions because it changes as you get more experience. So really knowing what you are good at really understanding what it is that you're good at is the first question really knowing what your true values are and you don't want a load of vanilla lovely generic terms you really want to understand what your values are and you know your values by understanding what you won't do because the opposite of that is is a value that you hold dear so I always talk about find those instances or think about those moments or instances where you've had some sort of visceral reaction uh, to something that's happened in work and think about what that situation was and the reaction that you had because if you think about what happened the opposite to that is a value that you hold dear so really understand your values absolutely know how you like to work so know the conditions which gets the best out of you so are you best about I don't know short lead times long lead times working on your own working with others so know how you tend to work and what gets the best out of you in terms of how you work and then the final questions about understanding the contribution that you're going to make to any organization and how you should be held accountable so if you can answer those four questions and it takes several iterations it takes several attempts it takes time um and you need to you know have clear answers to those four questions and then think about how you know we're all in marketing how do you sum that up into an end line um how would you sum that up into an end line so that when you were put into a position or put into a role people know what they're going to get because that's what it is about your personal brand people know what it is going to be and mine is absolutely um clear and it 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 really is about head performance coach. That's my personal brand. If you want your organization to perform, if you want a client's business to perform, if you want individuals to perform, bring me in. I have a coaching style of management. That's how I coach. I, I coach people to perform. I coach people through problems and it's head because I do like to be the person in charge. Yeah, I, I, I love that. That was sounding brilliant and quite theoretical and then you just slam dunked it into such an accessible metaphor. Um, so I, I think Richie and I have learned as much as anything uh, today in terms of some of the pearls of wisdom. Let's now let's get into Black Lives Matters and ethnicity. You've already given us some an example of overt racism. Mm. Um, we've asked a couple of, uh, of guests about their some examples of microaggressions because for for many people they just don't know, haven't experienced it. So the more examples we can share, the better. Just to have an, an access point into some of the, the reality of this. Look, I, I think it, it is those, and I, and I hate the term microaggression because the person on the end of it, it is anything but micro. Um, and I talk about, you know, somebody sort of said this to me and I got, yeah, that's such a brilliant analogy. Um, when you get a mosquito bite, it stings and it's annoying and it itches. And then if you have another mosquito bite on the same place, so if it's on your arm, you have another one and then another one and another one. By the end of the day, that arm is swollen and quite painful. And that's what it feels like because you carry it around all the time. So a little one on its own, it's annoying, but you can deal with it. But when it time and time again, it keeps building and building and building on the same arm. It becomes really painful and that's what it feels like. And it can be everything, anything from 
you know, you, you absolutely know that you've made a point in a meeting and nobody's heard it. And somebody else who is a white man makes exactly the same point in exactly the same way. And suddenly it's the best thing and everybody hears it. And suddenly that's a brilliant idea. It can be, you know, walking into a room and introductions are made and people go, you know, introduce themselves and somehow you're overlooked. It can be commentary about, oh, don't you wear really colourful clothing, Karen? Which I do. <laughs> um, but then the added comment about it really, only your skin tone, tone could really carry that off, couldn't it? Or commentary about, you know, God, you've got really full lips. You could take shares out in them. It's those little things that I have experienced during my career that happen. And people, you know, I have to see the good in people. I have to be optimistic and just believe that people don't realise, that they do not realise what they're saying and what they're doing. And I used to let it go. I really did. Early in my career, I used to let it go. And now I call it out. And I don't call it out to make the person uncomfortable, but I call it out to let them know how it's made me feel. Because there may be somebody more junior than me at the infancy of their career that it can have a massive effect. So I just, I just, it's, and sometimes it's just a change in wording. You know, I don't mind if somebody comments on how fabulous my clothing is, but just say that your clothing's fabulous. You don't need to point out the color of it and how it matches my skin tone or only my skin tone could carry it off. There's no need to. So it's just, sometimes it's just a change of expression or wording for people to understand what's okay and what's not okay. And, and Karen, you know, I, I, completely concur and on a personal level you know I, I think that's I think that's absolutely the right thing to to be doing um I just wondered and and to get your take on on more of an institutional level say at a WPP level what are the kind of things that um you guys are putting in place to to help the situation look I I always talk about how um sometimes things happen or things are said because you don't have someone that you can talk to and go to and and you know check is this okay is that not okay ever is that offensive and the amazing june sarpong who is a really good friend in her book diversify she talked about how as leaders we all need to check our circles and checking our circles is thinking about you know think about the last four people that you telephoned look think about your recent call list and the four people that you called from work or think about the four people that you call into a meeting or you send an email to when something good has happened when there's a crisis about to happen think about who those closest four people are your circle of people if those four people have had the same sort of educational background as you have got the same sort of ethnicity as you, have, are the same sort of social economic status as you, and they're basically you, but a different person, then none of us are doing anything to sort of promote and help diversity, inclusion and belonging. And that's the most important thing, that belonging, people feeling that if you're not seen as mainstream or in the majority, you feel as though you don't belong. When you're one of a few, it can be difficult because you don't feel as though you belong. So I talk about diversity as lots of people from different backgrounds uh, in a room. Inclusion is people from different backgrounds get to sit at the table, but belonging is then when you're heard and you're seen and you're listened to. And that's what we all need. So we all have to check our circle. So some of the core things at WPP that we're doing is ensuring that people check their circle. And part of that is through a sponsorship program and a sponsorship program, which is specifically aimed at protected groups or minority groups. So whether that's female or whether that's ethnic minorities to ensure that our senior leaders who may never have come into contact with anybody from a council estate in, I don't know, Halsden, suddenly get to hear about what it's like to be in a council estate in Halsden working in this industry and that's about social economic background as well as ethnicity as well as gender 
so that you realize that actually you need to widen your circle and think a bit broader so a sponsorship program is really important and then Nancy Langthorne who was my partner in crime at Mediacom when I was CEO and I sort of she used to be a business director she had four kids she came back and wanted to work in sort of diversity and inclusion and all the programs that are in place at Mediacom myself and Nancy did together and I've then sort of whipped Nancy out of Mediacom and she's now working with me in, at WPP so she's head of diversity and inclusion at WPP in the UK and one of the brilliant programs that you know on the back of all of the events of George Floyd and Black Lives Matters is an allyship training program so that I need allies I cannot be the one black friend that everybody has I need allies that will help sponsor champion cheerlead fight protect call things out when they see things are wrong so we're looking at allyship training um, and i have to give a kudos to mediacom as well so nancy's still part of her times at mediacom who are doing microaggression training as well so again to understand what it looks like what it feels like and what you can do no matter what level you are what role you have to help somebody that's experiencing it Karen, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. It seems like some amazing initiatives that are happening to, to, to help this, this, this cause. Um, like I, I'm sure we could talk all morning, but being conscious of both your time as well as, as everyone else um, on the show today. So um, I just want to say a massive thank you on behalf of myself and Mark. It has been truly both inspirational but informational at the same time. I mean, I know Mark's been busy scribbling everything down. Um, <laughs> as we've gone along and, and as, as I do, it's just been completely off the hook from my perspective. So thank you so much for sharing. My time. absolute pleasure. It's thank you very much. Of you. So um, much inspiration. Yeah. Pleasure. Um, guys, for everyone who is currently attending on the show, please do know that we are here every Friday, 8 a.m. Eat your Weedabix and tune in, right? And um, hey, what better way to spend your Friday mornings before you get back into work? We've got some amazing guests coming up for you. Um, over the next week. So next week, we've got uh, Tom Goodwin. Um, and then thereafter, we've got Lord Karan Billamoria, who um, is, of course, the founder of Cobra Beer and, and Lord um, of Chelsea and Kensington. So look, without further ado, please do um, tune in. Um, last chance, to take that screen grab to win that amazing chance to spend a little bit of time with Karen. You already know how busy um, this, this tremendous woman is. So please do take that screen grab post on LinkedIn with your favorite question that you would ask her for a chance to spend a little bit of that one-to-one -one mentoring time with her. So again, Karen, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. And seeing everyone else soon. Thank you, Karen. Have a great weekend, everyone.